All right, well, I, I am talking today about anarcho-syndicalism, which is basically one form or version of anarchism. And to understand anarcho-syndicalism, I even, I still get confused at times all the kind of subtle differences between different forms of anarchism. There's like anarcho-communism, I don't know, you could just go kind of on and on, collectivism. Uh, and I sometimes have a difficult time understanding the differences, but to understand anarcho-syndicalism is basically the idea that through unions, revolutionary unions, that's the way to bring about socialism. And a, a good definition of socialism is worker control and ownership of the means of production. Factories, farms, all the things that you know, we need to produce the things that we need to live. So that's a, a, a definition of socialism. And there are a lot of different ways you can try to get to socialism. And different socialists will kind of accuse other socialists of not really being socialists because they go about it this way or that way. But there are some, you know, seemingly legitimate different ways you could go about it. Um, one way that you guys are probably very familiar with from coming to RSU meetings is through the apparatus of the party, through a political party, for example, the Bolshevik party in Russia. Um, they were able to take control of the state and govern the country by means of the Communist Party, take control of the means of production, basically centralize everything under control of the party. So that's one way to do it. And again, some people might say, well, hey, that's not really socialism, but um, that's not, again, a debate I guess we need to get into now, but that's, that's what some people say. Another way to do it is through parliamentarism. And that's basically by you know, trying to elect socialist candidates to the parliament, trying to elect a socialist president, and enact reforms and changes or moving towards socialism through passing laws and things like that. And that's largely the approach that the Social Democrats took in Germany um, in the period between World War I and the rise of the Nazi Party. So, according to the anarcho-syndicalist um, view, rather than having trying to implement socialism by way of the party or by way of getting candidates voted into office, the way to do it is instead through uh, trade unions. So, let me just go ahead and read uh, a couple passages that will explain things better than I uh, would be able to. This is from a book called Anarcho-Syndicalism by a German fellow named Rudolf Rocker, who, um, I don't know, he's, I really like, uh, I really like this book, I just got it recently, and he's one of the major anarchist histor historians, so he had a really good knowledge of anarchist movement as a whole. And anyways, he wrote this book, Anarcho-Syndicalism, that's what I'm going to be reading from. So this quote talks about the purpose of uh, anarcho-syndicalism and what it's trying to accomplish. It says, basically the task of anarcho-syndicalism is freeing labor from all the fetters which economic exploitation has fastened on it, of freeing society from all the institutions and procedure of political power, and of opening the way to an alliance of free groups of men and women based on cooperative labor and a planned administration of the things in the interest of the community. To prepare the toiling masses in city and country for this great goal and to bind them together as a militant force is the objective of modern anarcho-syndicalism and in this its whole purpose is exhausted. And the word syndicalism or syndicate is actually another word for trade union. So you can kind of keep that in mind when you hear, when you hear that word. Um, so part of the role of trade unions, not just anarch anarcho-syndicalist trade unions, but just any trade unions, is to improve the condition of the workers, get better wages, um, you know, get better working conditions, try to get more of the profit that's produced by the workers coming back to the workers as, as opposed to going into the pockets of the capitalists. And there are some uh, socialists and even some anarchists who dismiss that as being 
uh, kind of like a waste of time, a waste of energy to have uh, unions really fighting hard to improve the condition of the workers. But according to the anarcho-syndicalist view, unions are basically, let me actually get the quote here. Oh, here we go. For unions, uh, or according to the anarcho-syndicalist view, the trade union is by no means a mere transitory phenomenon bound up with the duration of capitalist society. It is the germ of the socialist economy of the future, the elementary school of socialism in general. So not only should workers be fighting for better wages, um, but in addition, that's forming the organization which at some point in the future, when a revolution comes, that will take over the factories, take over production, and allow society conti to uh, continue to, uh, to move forward. That's how society will be run, is based off of trade unions. And so these struggles for just better wages, um, of course it's good just because it ameliorates misery and poverty amongst the workers, but also in the course of struggling against the employers for better wages and better working conditions, this is basically a, a school of socialism, so to speak, for the workers, teaching them that they need to fight and struggle um, against capitalism for everything. Um, so that's really important to be in, again, from the anarcho-syndicalist view, to be involved in those type of uh, trade union um, uh, activities. Um, here's another quote that kind of pre or, you know, explains that point. It says, the lance head of the labor movement is, therefore, not the political party, but the trade union toughened by daily combat and permeated by socialist spirit. Um, and here's a little bit uh, longer explanation of that because this is kind of a really important point. According to the syndicalist view, the trade union, the syndicate, is the unified organization of labor and has for its purpose the defense of the interests of the producers within existing society and the preparing for and the practical carrying out of the reconstruction of social life after the pattern of socialism. It has therefore a double purpose. One, as the fighting organization of the workers against the employers to enforce the demands of the workers for the safeguarding and raising of their, li of their standard of living. And two, as the school for the intellectual training of the workers to make them acquainted with the technical management of production and economic life in general, so that when a revolutionary situation arises, they will be capable of taking the socio-economic organism into their own hands and remaking it according to socialist principles. That's another aspect too, is that again, it, you know, if a revolution were to come, the trade unions would continue, and that's how society would function is based off these trade unions, as opposed to, for example, uh, under in Soviet Russia, the trade unions were either abolished or taken under, or, or basically came under the control of the, of the Communist Party. Um, the next uh, thing that I want to read over here is that there there would basically be two different ways in which unions would be organized to again um, carry out the basic functions of society, which is producing what we need to survive and also um, distributing what people need to live. So there's on the production side a method of organization and on the consumption side a method of organization. And on the production side, unions in each of the different industries would basically combine to create um, industrial alliances. So for example, you'd have all of the unions in the oil industry, for example, would have, would form an industrial alliance to basically um, carry on production of oil in, in that particular field. Same thing with, say, you know, farming or producing food. Same thing with, uh, you know, producing coal. Whatever um, branch of industry there is, those different trade unions would basically form a federation and democratically get together to pl plan and decide what needs to be produced, how much needs to be produced. On the other end of things, uh, in terms of the consumption side, 
you would have unions that um, are forming like an alliance or a federation based on a geographic area. So, you know, and these unions or this federation of unions based on a geographic area would be the ones responsible for distributing the goods that are produced by these industrial federations, again, to ensure that you know, everyone has what they need rather than, of course, in a capitalist system where you only get what you're able to purchase you know, if you're wealthy enough or have the money to buy things. If you don't have that, then you starve or you die due to lack of health care or whatever. So it's a way of ensuring that enough gets produced for everyone and that everyone gets a share of everything that is, uh, that is produced. Um, there is a quote about that, but that, you know, that's a little bit long and the, the wording is a little bit... Um, well, here's maybe a way to summarize it. It says, in a word, organization of the plants by the producers themselves and the direction of the work by labor councils elected by them. So again, within each given, say, factory or company, there would be a workers' council that would govern that particular company uh, democratically. Secondly, organization of the total production of the country by the industrial and agricultural alliances. Again, the unions combining based on an industry. And then the third thing is organization of consumption by the labor cartels is what he refers to as the labor unions that would be organized on a geographic basis. So that kind of gives you a basic idea of how a society like that would be organized. A lot of times talking to someone about anarchism that doesn't know much or anything about it, you just think there's no government. And so of course the idea that gets conjured up in your head is, well, there's just chaos and everyone, you know, there's no organization. and that is not the case. In an anarchist society, it's a very highly organized society, but it's organized on uh, lines different from the lines that our society now is organized on, which is the violence of the state and the, the violence and exploitation of capitalists um, directed against workers. There are, on the other hand, some anarchists, though, who I guess, correct me, Greg, if I'm wrong, would be uh, described as like insurrectionist anarchists. And people like that are very opposed to organization. They don't want to form any long-standing, stable uh, organizations. They just kind of want to do their thing, come as they go, maybe get together in, in small groups or organizations for a specific purpose or a specific time. And they don't have any organized or systematic way um, you know, for to basically run a society. And so that would be in contrast to anarcho-syndicalists who are highly organized, or should be highly organized. Um, now, what are the different, uh, what are the different methods? How, if you had a very strong anarcho-syndicalist movement in a country, what are some of the methods that they could use to overthrow capitalism and establish an anarchist society? Um, well, the main, I'll just take, give you a quick list. There are strikes, where of course just the workers in one particular company go on strike. There's the sympathetic strike, where say, um, you know, workers in a particular industry or company are in a struggle against the employers. There would be people from other, or workers from other companies or other industries that would go on strike in, in solidarity with those who are actually in the struggle. Um, there's the boycott, um, making sure that uh, companies who don't, um, who try to suppress unions um, or fight against the unions or prevent their workers from organizing, um, the other unions would organize boycotts to not buy you know, products from that particular company. Um, the other thing is sabotage. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thing I didn't know about before reading this book, but in the early, early stages of the labor movement, um, like 1700s, 1600s, 1700s, there was a movement called Luddism. And I always grew up hearing that a Luddite was just someone who hated technology. In fact, I remember there was this one time when I was on my mission in Germany, sorry to have a, a religious aside, 
But I ended up running into this Catholic priest and talking to him in, on the street in a city called Heidelberg. And I was telling him that I was Mormon, and he's like, no, you're not Mormon. I'm like, well, yeah, I am. I got a name badge on right here. <laughs> And he's like, no, if you were Mormon, you wouldn't use electricity, you wouldn't be wearing like, modern clothes and all those things. So he kind of thought that I was a Luddite in the, the popular term that I used to think about it in. Just, oh, we hate technology, and I didn't really understand why. But it turns out that the Luddites, it was a militant workers' movement at a time when industrialization or the Industrial Revolution was going on. And so machines were displacing workers from their jobs and their positions. Workers were, were being thrown out of their jobs. Um, because they weren't needed anymore, the machines were doing the work. So there were there was this workers movement to go around and sabotage machines and destroy them um, to prevent workers from, from being being tossed out of work. And there was kind of like a, a myth about someone named King Lud that would go around like destroying machines and factories and things like that. So at any rate, if you're in a struggle against your employer, you can basically sabotage um, Machines, if that's part of what are, are used in that particular company, um, make sure that they can't be used in case um, other workers come in as um, scabs to break the strike. Another, or the most common form of sabotage is just to work slowly. Um, so these are all different tactics, just to go really slow and just take your sweet ass time um, doing whatever it is that your capitalist boss is trying to make you do. So those are all different methods that anarcho-syndicalists would use to fight employers. And then, of course, the main one is the general strike. If you have a strong enough um, uh, labor movement, you can have a general strike where you're able to basically shut all of society down, especially if you control or, or have workers that, that operate in like the really key um, parts of the society, transportation, energy, um, you're able to shut down an entire society, even if just a few of those core industries are, are shut down due to, due to a strike. So, if there's any type of struggle, um, that's one way that workers can wield a lot of power. And in the view of, of Rudolf Rocker, for example, you can wield a lot more power as workers by engaging in these type of um, tactics, especially the general strike, then you could wield if you're trying to get legislation passed, um, you know, through the parliament. Because even if a law does get passed, um, that's actually beneficial to workers, uh, which is obviously a good thing, and you would welcome that. But even if such a law does get passed, there's no guarantee that the government will actually enforce it. And the only reason when such laws are passed that they do get enforced is because, in his view, there's a strong labor movement that is there that will give hell to the government if you know things aren't enforced properly. So there are other anarchists as well who would take the approach that you shouldn't be involved in politics at all, or anything that has to do with the government. It's a waste of time. Um, again, whether it's voting, or, oh, who cares about this law or that law, or if we have this political right or that political right, because, you know, fuck the government type of thing. Um, from the anarcho-syndicalist view, that's actually wrong, because you want to basically, um, you want to fight for any political and economic rights you can possibly can, that you possibly can, and any economic or political or civil rights that have been granted to people, not because the government or the capitalist class is benevolent and bestowed that on us, but rather because popular organizations are fighting for those things and you compel the government to give them. Um, but those should all be um, protected militantly and fought for um, and preserved. So um, it's not that you should be involved in politics, but you should be involved in, in a different way, in a direct way. And so that's why anarcho-syndicalists would often refer to um, endorsing direct action, again doing things like the general strike, mass mobilizations of workers, rather than doing indirect action, which would be you know trying to maybe get some candidate elected to parliament or the city council or something like that. So just kind of a difference in, in approaches there. Um, a lot of people also, when it comes to anarchism, they ask, well, when has... Uh, when have, has there ever been an anarchist society? And if you've talked to an anarchist, hopefully they said, well, in Spain, 
as was, or during the Spanish Civil War, there were large sections of the country, um, especially in Catalonia, um, that were governed along uh, anarchist lines. When the fascists um, tried to take over the country and the Civil War began in 1936, um, that basically sp spurred the um, anarchist movement in Spain to take over large sections of the country, um, take over the factories, continue to, to uh, keep society functioning. When it came to agriculture and land, um, they had two approaches, either People were allowed to keep the land, of course, that they were already working or were given some land that they could work individually on their own. Or if people voluntarily wanted to form collectivized farms, then those were supported as well. So there were both collect there's both collective farming and individual farming. But the point is each person has ownership of the means of production on their own that they own and can work and provide for themselves and, and provide for others. And that, again, would be in contrast to the Soviet Union, where there was forced collectivization of peasantry. Um, so in Spain, su supposedly, I guess anytime you talk about historical questions, you can debate it, but the anarchists did a very, very good job of increasing production, including uh, being able to produce weapons and, and, and arms to fight against the fascists during the Civil War. And so that period of Spanish history is looked at um, from 1936 on uh, until the fascists ended up winning the war as being um, like a good example of anarchist um, principles in, in practice or in action. And of course that experiment was destroyed when the fascists did win the war and uh, basically destroyed the labor movement in Spain. So, um, aspects I wanted to cover. No, apparently there are still, uh, even though anarcho-syndicalism is not, um, I mean, there's not much of an anarcho-syndicalist movement in the world anymore, um, even though at times, again, especially in Spain and even in the United States, there is a very strong anarcho-syndicalist movement. Um, but there are, um, especially in Sweden, uh, a couple really strong anarcho-syndicalist unions, um, and some in France and elsewhere. Um, maybe to return to one quick point about being involved in like politics and political struggles, the anarcho-syndicalists in uh, the United States in the 1800s were very heavily involved in getting legislation passed um, for the eight-hour workday. But again, it wasn't through necessarily electing politicians that would pass this legislation. It was through doing general strikes, having mass mobilizations. Um, huge street protests and things like that. And that's what led to um, some of the most uh, famous anarchists, at least from the U.S., uh, being executed, uh, namely the Haymarket Square Martyrs, where as part of the big rallies um, and the strikes that were going on to, to have that law passed, um, there was a big rally one day and the cops, of course, showed up and um, shot a couple demonstrators. A few days later, there was another counter rally in order to, um, you know, just kind of keep the momentum going and also protest against um, against the workers that were shot by the police. This time, the police showed up again, um, but someone threw a bomb into the crowd of police and killed a few policemen, I believe. And so that kind of set off a big witch hunt where um, the labor um, leaders in Chicago at that time were kind of rounded up, and in particular, there was a small group of anarchists. Um, who were some of the most prominent prominent labor leaders, um, most of whom were German, and I think about five of them ended up being executed. So Albert Parsons is um, an example of one of the Haymarket Square Martyrs. But again, that's an example of anarchists who were actively pushing um, or fighting for political uh, in the political realm um, to improve conditions for workers, but they were doing it in a in a in a different way, using direct action rather than, than indirect action. So uh, that's basically it. And if you guys have any questions? I don't know if that's kind of a boring topic because talking about unions, <laughs> this and like uh, you know industrial federations. That hopefully it wasn't too boring. But I'll, I'll spare myself just for a second.
<laughs> yeah, I was just uh, wondering, um, I mean, does anarcho-syndicalism allow for any kind of, uh, like, apparatus to, uh, to ensure a, a unity of tactics? I mean, just so you don't have, like, different tr uh, trade unions just kind of bickering among themselves. I mean, like, you know, like, is there something like, you know, like, uh, like Marxist Leninists have the, have the party, or like, you know, some anarchists have, like, platformism, right, to, or like, you know, the IWW with, like, the one big union idea? Something to just kind of ensure that the, that the movement is moving in a unified and re revolutionary direction? <coughs> uh, you know, I don't know exactly how they would have done that, like, in Spain, for example. I mean, one thing I know is that in order to get to the point where they were able to take over large, you know, or, or pretty large amount of territory in Spain, that was a result of you know 40 or 50 years of organizing and education of the workers, um, but I I'm not quite sure actually how they how they did that. But maybe you, other people might even know or know more. Right. Oh yeah, it's really easy. They didn't. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, you had you had obviously anarchists fighting the Marxists and the Trotskyists and the so-called Stalinists. Um, but in ke several key areas, in several key districts, especially in southwestern uh, Spain, you even had breaks between uh, the CNT, uh, which was one anarchist union that believed in participating in the government, and also the FAI, um, which did not believe in working with the government. And generally speaking, you hear them together, the CNT, FAI. Um, but as a matter of fact, in many key respects, in many key battles, in many key um, production issues, various local CNT and various local FAI uh, unions not only didn't cooperate, but in some instances it actually led to violent conflict between the two unions. Yeah, um, you mentioned Spain as the example, and obviously the experiment ended, as I think you put it, um, with obviously Franco coming through and sort of uh, annihilating everything. Um, I mean, how do you, how do you, I mean, especially when you tie this to the sort of notion where you're saying, well, anarcho syndicalism you know, when, whenever the revolutionary situation you know, happens, it's going to come about. Uh, it's a really good way to keep society functioning, right? Because obviously the unions will be able to keep production going while whatever revolution is happening. But it, it seems to me that that's almost not the case, especially with your Spain example. As to where, again, I'm, I'm going to obviously take in. Talk to a peasant who has explained that we don't recognize you as a king, we're not the same as commune. And he tried to explain that, you know, because the lady of the lake grabbed him Excalibur, he was fit to rule, to which the anarcho syndicalist, you know, said that supreme executive power derives from mandate from masses, not from some bicycle aquatic ceremony. If you go around wielding supreme executive power, it becomes a watery tart through a sword at you. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, I saw that movie probably like 50 times as a kid and then like actually saw it. Like the only time I've seen it since I was a kid was maybe a year ago. And I was sitting there listening and I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> where, where did that come from? Okay. Thanks, man. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Max. Oh, oh, sorry. And Chris and Amber. Oh, yeah. Chris, yeah. Maybe Chris yeah. Chris go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I just, I mean, I was wondering about policy. If anarcho syndicalism was to take place about um, transparency and permanency of committees, how, I mean, democratically, but if someone were elected and they weren't doing an appropriate job, how would they be vetoed? Well, again, um, things are to be run democratically, so whether it's in the workers' council in an individual factory or company, for example, or um, delegates would be sent to the like the federation that's organized at the higher level. The examples I've heard of was that you know people that were elected to those positions would serve like a pretty limited period of time, maybe like a year, and would you know receive the same like pay that a worker that any other worker would. So it kind of prevented this like like a privileged class from developing by having some people like Orrin Hatch, who's like been a senator for. 200 years or something, and having those people make a lot of money more than just like your average worker. So that's the example I've heard. Oh. Well, Greg touched on my question on the historical note with um, uh, anarchist Spain, but on a theoretical note, um, would or has has have there been anarchist uh, movements that have uh, gone through you know social democratic ways of, of protecting civil rights that have been passed? I mean, because you, you said um, 
you know, they would want to do direct action um, with mass strikes and, and labor movements, and that's how they would, you know, get stuff done, so to speak. But, um, yeah, is, ha have there been in the past, you know, gone through uh, ways of electing, you know, mayors and stuff like that, or electing socialist people in seats to protect civil rights? Well, again, they just totally, you know. Yeah, that, like that wouldn't really be the, the focus to like, get people elected, but rather kind of like by using these other methods compel whoever happens to be in office. Which, I mean, you kind of see some of the wisdom in that from just like the experience of Barack Obama. Because I remember hearing him early in the campaign and you know, he had this Jeremiah, this Reverend Jeremiah Wright that he, apparently he was buddies with, who was saying all kinds of great things, and so he kind of wondered, gee, I wonder if Obama's not that bad of a guy after all, and of course he gets elected, and he's just about the same as Bush, I haven't really done anything yeah. different. So, again, it's the idea of not putting, like, really much or any faith in, in a particular politician. But some of the early anarchists, like, um, um, again, Albert Parsons, he um, ran for a couple different political offices. He was even like a, so, like a socialist party candidate for, for president um, when he was like 30 years old. And he, in his quick brief autobiography, which we actually published in the last issue of The Warren Worker, he talks about becoming disillusioned after himself participating in like parliament, like parliament style Elections. politics. Right. So. Yeah, well, the, the uh, Barack Obama being, you know, Socialist is is one example I was thinking of. So, <laughs> thank thank you, Scott, right there. Um, for me, it it seems like a lot of these historical anecdotes end up end in the following way: a bunch of people show up, they have guns, and then they shoot the anarcho syndicalists. How how do anarcho syndicalists um, kind of perform either action or counteraction that you know, results in military violence or something like that? Like, is there a way that yeah, I mean, in Spain, like they didn't just roll over friendly. They're, they're fighting fascists, right? So, I mean, in what ways did they organize to defend themselves? Um, yeah, I don't know, like tons of details how they did that. Again, maybe Greg will want to comment, but they did have a militia, like a voluntary militia. They had, I think, maybe 120,000 fighters. The other example is um, Nestor Machno, who was an anarchist who, um, you know, ended up uh, fighting against the Bolsheviks and losing, but he had an army. So, uh, you know, just popular militias, I guess, would be the answer. How effective are, are they, they were. How, how, would, how would these militias spring up from these trade union struggles? Uh, yeah, I don't know the details of how they organized it. Okay, I'm maybe great. Fancy. Uh, well, I mean, the basic anarchist strategy, at least in Spain, and to a certain extent in, uh, it was a little different in Russia. In Russia, it was, Everyone owns a gun anyway, because you're all deserving soldiers, so you just form a militia out of it. Um, for Spain, it was uh, hit, sack it, uh, an armory, and then pass out a gun to everyone in the Union. Um, which actually leads into my, uh, my two questions, um, given that there's Nestor Machno and this, this uh, Spanish anarchist. Um, one of the critiques, uh, which was even leveled in your, or, or, or noted in your um, presentation, was that you know the Bolsheviks had to use the excessive amount of violence and and you know that's the only reason they were able to maintain the regime. But the two anarchist examples used Nestor Machno. Um, I would point to a recent essay uh, by the chair of the History Department of Berlin called "Tear Them Apart and Be Done with It: The Ottoman Leadership of Nestor Machno," in which the entire movement is held together by essentially a cult of personality around Nestor Machno and the brutal discipline um, through executions, guttings, uh, throwing priests into um, running steam engines, burying alive, burying alive, burning alive, gutting, uh, pulling fingernails, beheading, etc., uh, as a means to maintain order in his army. Um, and, and additionally, how do you, how do you, how would you respond to the fact that the violence, uh, for example, the violence of dechristianization in Spain, perpetrated by primarily the anarchists? Um, which killed um, an undocumented amount, but certainly in the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, in Spain. Yeah. Uh, in making reference to violence, 
in terms of that particular presentation. It had more to do with like how the economic system continued, and especially that example, which stood out to me, give like under the under like a more anarchist conception where people aren't supposed to be forced to doing things. Um, whether it ends up that way in practice, maybe is a different question at times, obviously. Um, but in, for example, the question of collectivization of like agriculture, it was a voluntary thing, and people wanted to just like continue to work their land, they were allowed to do that. If people wanted to collectivize, they were allowed to do that. So it was based on uh, more of a voluntary system. Um, as opposed to, this, again, the Soviet model where it was just like forced collectivization, which led to a lot of people dying. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, anarchists have never committed atrocities or done bad things or killed priests and things like that. I mean, clearly as a Christian, I'm not a big fan of like murdering priests or boiling them alive or whatever else happened. So that's kind of an unfortunate um, aspect of, for sure, the anarchist movement, but also like the socialist movement more broadly. Even though it started out, again, um, giving examples like Gerard Wynne Stanley, uh, or like the Peasants' War that Engels wrote about. I mean, most socialism had Christian origins and later with Marx and others um, took on a very atheist character. In my view, socialism or anarchism, Marxism, Leninism, whatever, should be just kind of neutral on the question of religion. So the fact that a lot of priests were killed and they, I mean, that I don't know is inherent to anarchism. I think it was just their, you know, unfortunate prejudices against religious people at the time. Can I do a brief follow-up on that? Uh, sure. But, I, I mean, so to turn the historical question into a theoretical question, um, certainly Marxist Leninists, the Bolsheviks, um, Mao, Castro, uh, Che, the FARC, etc., um, have killed plenty of people, lots of people, lots and lots and lots and lots of people. Um, obviously, uh, both anarchists and Marxist Leninists should be said to kill a lot less than capitalism does. Um, but nevertheless, for the Marxist Leninists, because there's a rigorous theoretical um, well, just simply theorization of violence. Um, yeah, there's bleed over, but you can see the general direction where violence goes. It goes towards landowners, it goes towards capitalists, it goes towards um, people concretely undermining the revolution at a particular time, whether that's you know, uh, withholding supplies or you know, you know, striking or whatever. But theoretically, it seems that anarchism has not theorized any system of revolutionary violence. And so there's just a vague conception of revolutionary violence as something vaguely defensive, so that when push comes to shove, the rubber hits the road, the theory, theory hits the practice, because anarchism does not have a coherent theory of violence, the violence doesn't appear as any, even, even an unfortunately or perhaps even badly directed form of violence, it appears as a mass of spontaneous, undirected violence in the form of, you know, to. To, to play on the words, have anarchy. Um, so how would you respond to that? Do you think there is a coherent theory of anarchist violence, or do you think that anarchism doesn't have to answer this theoretical challenge, or do you think that the theoretical challenge plays no part in the actual concrete manifestation of anarchism historically? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a great answer for it, but again, like, in terms of, like, how do you accomplish a revolution, that's not, like, the basis of how it could be accomplished. I mean, with, say, Che, you know, it was a guerrilla war. I mean, he had a particular strategy for bringing about the revolution. And, you know, obviously that focused on using violence. In the case of Cuba, it didn't require a whole lot of violence. But um, as far as anarchism goes, again, it's the general strike, those are the methods. There's not this idea that there should be any focus on armed struggle or killing people but rather that, you know, basically there's the general strike. You can shut society down and compel, um, you know, the capitalist classes to basically, um, I guess, give up power, so to speak, by being able to, you know, bring society to its knees because you're the ones that are organized and can control industry and all these different things. The idea is that workers have power, the masses have power, that if you're organized properly is something that, 
you know, the government or the capitalist class can't, um, can't overcome, basically. So in, in cases of, say, you know, what happened with Nestor Machno, again, I apologize, I don't know the history very well, and I don't want to apologize for things that people might have done, that, you know, they did things like that. But I don't see, like, an emphasis on, on violence in terms of, like, how do you accomplish a revolution? How, whether there are good safeguards to prevent tons of violence from breaking out as shit gets out of control. I don't know, maybe there's a big weakness there. Yeah, I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to, like, uh, clear something up so people don't get the wrong idea about uh, anarchists killing clergy people in Spain and in Russia. Uh, basically, the Catholic Church, and in the case of the Russians, the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, like Catholic, Catholicism especially is uh, basically during that time especially is always cited on the side of fascists and they were definitely and basically like they I mean like as a horrible otherwise horrible person Christopher Christopher Hitchens has pointed out that uh, that fascism is basically just the right wing of the Catholic of the Catholic uh, of the Catholic clergy or uh, the Catholic uh, populace so uh, when anarchists are going out and killing clergy it's not just because they hate religion that's because these people were siding with the fascists Drudy said the only church that illuminates is one that burns. Once again, we lived in, in Spain where, uh, that, where Catholicism was intimately tied up with the state and was intimately tied up with fascism. Uh, no, I mean, that's a valid point that each, in every situation, you kind of have to look at the concrete um, situation that people lived in. Um, you know, just like there's a reason that um, Palestinians kill Israeli soldiers. Palestinian killing an Israeli soldier is different than a German killing a Jew in a concentration camp because yep. the situations are just entirely different. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And churches, you know, just like have obviously done a lot of reactionary, terrible things over the years. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So, um, I, I'll just bring up two points. One would be on uh, Leninism and, and the sort of question of religion. And uh, I don't have the exact quote or context for it right now. I'll get it to you, though. But, I mean, it's, it's a very pragmatic approach. It's like, look, uh, I mean, even, even the uh, 1905 revolution, the failed one, was led by a religious leader, um, which ended up in a massacre. But there's sort of notion that you don't just out and out disregard religion because, oh, it's, it's God and whatnot and everything like that. I mean, you should be able to wor work with it, I mean, as is in cases of even with liberation theology and whatnot. So it's, it's, it's a very pragmatic approach, I think, at least in the Marxist tradition of dealing with religion. Um, which, I mean, sometimes does end in uh, churches getting bulldozed. Um, but also, I mean, even Stalin during World War II let churches also exist uh, when the, um, Russia was invaded um, to, to boost morale. Then the second thing I would say is, um, you talked a second ago, you're like, oh yeah, well, it's general strikes that are going to sort of win the day for anarcho syndicalism. But I mean, even at this point, uh, I, I think the failure is when you live with neighbors, I, I mean, especially going back to Spain, right? You live with, um, in Europe, and one country goes anarcho-syndicalist in the middle of, of the beginnings of a world war. Um, it doesn't really pan out so well. And even then, uh, I, I would broaden the question, do you need a global strike then in order to, for anarcho-syndicalism to defeat global capitalism? Or how does that going to play out? Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, it's a hard thing to do because you need a lot more people involved to do something like this. Mm. I mean, like what Lenin did, for example, just required a lot fewer people. Um, in those situations, it is you know easier to coordinate what you're doing, and, and when you're very centralized, it's easier to make decisions and kind of say this is what will or will not happen. But yeah, I don't know. That's definitely a problem. Yeah. Um, as a historical note, everybody who was against the fascists in the Spanish Civil War were known as the Republicans because it encompassed, you know, various leftist groups that just simply weren't fascists. Do you think, um, on on um, on a theoretical note of centralization, victory to the fascists uh, it might have something to do with them? You know, not only having more funding, but again being centralized, whereas the Republicans fought amongst themselves and, and didn't have any sort of unity like you know like Josh pointed out maybe with platformism you, you might have more of a unified centralized you know ideology backing everything up and giving everything you know some cohesion uh, the Republicans concretely they didn't have that so I I don't know what, what do you think about centralization with at least in principle with anarcho syndicalism do you think it's um, 
you know, with why? Well, there's definitely, you know, with uh, like one argument that we tend to have, I think, with the Marxist Leninists, or when, when we're talking, like you guys tend to focus on like effectiveness and efficiency. And I think as far as anarchists go, we tend to focus on um, maybe like more like um, rather than like effectiveness, it would be more like the morality of it, so to speak. Not that Marxist Leninists are moral, that's not what I'm trying to say. We, we, just we, for the record, we refer the term uh, the, the composition of the Re Russian revolutionary sweep with the uh, American efficiency. So, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that Marxist Leninists aren't moral, that's not it at all. The, work, the, the anarchists um, are typically a little more concerned with like, how things are done and what type of like, a result we're going to have in terms of like, well, will there be authoritarianism and oppression as a result of what's happening. And I, just, I do get the impression that for you guys it's more of like, effectiveness and results. So like the reason that Marxism Leninism is a superior ideology is because we can point to these concrete results like here's Cuba, here's the Soviet Union, here's what they accomplished, these revolutions were successful. And at the same time you guys are critical of anarchism because it's like, well, look they weren't successful. The anarcho syndicalists in Spain were smashed by the fascists. So that effectiveness kind of gives Marxism Leninism kind of has the upper hand over anarchism, so to speak. And, you know, there's some, there's some validity to that because if you don't accomplish a revolution, then um, that obviously has terrible consequences if capitalism continues or if the revolution just fails and, like, the Paris Commune, a bunch of people get slaughtered. So there's some validity to that, but my sense is, as far as anarchists go, and this is kind of my sense as to why I was, like, more drawn to anarchism, is maybe coming at it from more of a religious perspective is that um, here are some principles about like the right way to live, to not have coercion and a master and a slave. And I never really thought much about how effective or efficient or how what are the chances of success of this movement is more kind of like, you know, again, from a Christian perspective, you grow up saying, well, I'm supposed to be nice to people, I'm supposed to follow the Ten Commandments or whatever, like how should I live? And to me, I feel like maybe anarchists think in that way a little bit more than maybe the Marxist Leninists do. So let's put aside practicality and let's discuss uh, the critique that uh, anarcho-syndicalism especially just re uh, reproduces bourgeois, uh, petty bourgeois capitalism. Um, there are two theoretical points that were brought up, which is that the anarcho-syndicalists have two, essentially two, two functioning syndicates. Uh, one is a function of production and two is a consumption. Um, along geographic distributions. Um, in regards to the productive consumption, because that productive consumption is done on an individual syndicate basis, and right there's free association, um, which means that free association is entered into on the basis of either self-interest of the individual as a free associator, or uh, self-interest as a particular syndicate as it federates with other syndicates. Um, how does this not simply reproduce the dynamics of capitalism, which is the fundamental mode, despite the, uh, the collective structure of it, is governed intentionally through its rational decisions on collective or individual, or not, not necessarily even collective, but individual self-interest on the basis of any individual worker, and also collective self-interest or group self-interest in the regards to any, any syndicate. How does that not reproduce the dynamic of capital where any given worker or individual in a capital society acts upon their own self-interest and any given firm, any given business, as an analogy, a, a nearly direct analogy, um, acts in its own self-interest uh, with all, in, comp in, in cooperation with other firms that, for example, supply it, but in competition with all other firms that provide the same service or materials? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think of how that would be. That would be imagined. I mean, from this from this book, uh, I guess it didn't deal with that question. But I got the impression that it, essentially it was like production is almost centrally planned in a way that, but basically by like the industrial federation, for example. 
So the question of like particular unions like opting out, you know, if it's maybe not in their self-interest to do so, um, yeah, I don't know exactly how that would be dealt with, but it's it's just not the party at the top making decisions that are are passed down because of the fact that there's like democratic participation from the ground up by all the unions who then elect delegates to each of these industrial uh, federations and so forth. And then those industrial federations are again making decisions about like, hey, let's take the bigger picture into account and how much needs to be produced, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if the answer is well, probably not, but well, I don't have a great answer. Well, sure. there's an interesting dynamic uh, that we have, which is you'll notice that there's, there's a federation of, for example, banks. Uh, U.S. Bank owns a bunch of subsidiary regional banks. Those regional banks own a bunch of subsidiary uh, local banks. And you can take the entire banking industry, and it's about six. We'll, we'll, I mean, they're obviously, they're, the, the technical term is corporations, right? They're incorporated. Um, but another term, theoretical, although not technical term, yeah, for incorporation would be federation. So for any given in, uh, industry that we have, um, basically, uh, automotive, food, banking, uh, computers, video games, movies, you basically have six or seven federations that control or plan, centrally plan, um, economic production. And what you'll notice is, at any given consumer level, anyone can choose not to buy any product from any of these, or use any services of any of these given corporations. Um, any given worker can choose not to work for any of these um, corporations. Any given bank can choose, uh, with, with some gray area, can choose not to, um, to be incorporated or be taken over by these and can be privately held or collectively held. Um, so why, how, how then, if at any given point, any given person can in principle opt out, um, how does that make it fundamentally different from anarcho-syndicalism, except that you don't have a state present to ensure, ensure property? Uh, well, again, I mean, corporations now are not worker-controlled. They're for-profit. Whatever is produced is kept by a small number of people, and it's clearly not redistributed. Um, so again, I don't have a good answer for the terms of like how, um, I don't know, even under an anarcho-syndicalist system, you know, maybe individual workers, and certainly they could opt out, they don't have to like work uh, in that particular company or industry or whatever. But if the unions are what control industry through, again, creating federations and electing people to then manage those, um, those organizations, there's not a way for one of them to just say like, oh hey, you know, from now on all the money from, you know, this collective of banks is now going into my pocket. Um, it has to be basically democratically decided. So what would be in the interest of like all the workers that belong to that particular union would, would be what would be the outcome because it's democratically run. That would be my guess. Um, so let's presuppose an imaginary union. Um, in an anarcho-syndicalist country. And this country is desperately poor, um, except they have a natural resource, with, let's say oil. And this, it's a completely democratically run, it's a very strong democratic union um, that is looking out for its own collective interest, and this union decides, uh, hey, you know what? Um, it's in our best collective interest to, because we are the, the union that uh, runs the, the refineries, that runs um, the extraction, that runs the transportation, um, that we should take in all the products of our society so that the union that, or individuals that farm, the individuals that make jewelry, the individuals that make TV, um, they should give us all of that stuff for a very small price with almost no trade on our part because it's a desperately poor country. We control the one resource that matters and all of you in this country should basically, we have democratically decided as a union that we're going to strangle the rest of you, economically speaking, unless you give us everything you want, or everything we want. I mean, that's not ruled out by anarcho-syndicalism, is it? Talking about uh, Venezuela? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly <laughs> what happened with Venezuela with the oil company um, before Hugo Chavez came in and, you know, um, basically uh, broke up 
and it sounds really terrible, given that we're an American experience, um, but actually broke up this union that was using the Venezuelan state oil company to strangle the rest of Venezuelan society and to keep the excesses of profits for itself. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. I don't have an answer to that. Well, I mean, essentially, would, the, would not the, uh, the federation would be composed of all unions within that country, right? And so each union would have would probably have a vote, uh, probably just one vote or something along those lines, as opposed to like giving more votes to uh, one particular industry. So this, I mean, like I guess in a, in a sense that's a bit of like centralized authority, but essentially the federation could prevent that one union from doing that. That's correct. Well, except it can't, right? Because it's free association. So the very second that the federation says, by the way, you're not going to be able to strangle our economy, um, if we're holding to anarchist principles, then that union has the right and the ability to unfederate with the federation. And that's, that's just the problem with production. So it seems that that's an insoluble, not, not merely a practical problem, that's an insoluble principle problem that seems to be essentially recreating the, the very, it, it, it's not essential, right, but of course, there's plenty of people who support capitalism who say, well, it doesn't have to turn into large, faceless, multinational corporations that, you know, murder people worldwide and, and you know, strip the rainforest. But it seems that there is at least a strong, fundamental, theoretical basis for the restoration, or, or simply the, the continued functioning of capital, except capitalist is replaced with, you know, certain federations, a banking federation, or... Um, a, a, a very key industrial factor. How the more industrial or the more profitable industries yeah. not come to dominate anything else? Yeah. Um, and then the second is that there's um, a consumptive aspect, which is, the, is the, the geographic area uh, distributes and everyone gets a share. This again seems to have no theoretical basis, um, which seems that it would have to go with one of two things, which is either one, it does so simply out of the goodness of people's hearts, um, which is fine, um, but just looking at world history as of right now, that doesn't seem to be a, a really good way to bet, especially since capitalists are dominating, dominating everything. But then if these consumptive re, uh, ge uh, syndicates are fundamentally different from the productive syndicates, then it seems you've once again recreated um, at least a theoretical distinction between those who produce and those who consume. And that also the um, syndicate, which provides consumption, then provides um, a reconstitution of uh, exclusionary groups, um, especially given either one, everybody gets whatever who is, it happens to be in this region, um, which begs the question, well, why not everyone in every region? Um, so you just essentially have a reassertion uh, of nationalism under the guise of a, a consumptive syndicate, or um, you have the distribution of uh, production without any um, stipulations, without any qualifications, um, in which case then it seems that the productive syndicates would simply be, become the exploited masses um, to the parasitical, um, theoretically parasitical, like everyone can be perfectly fine with it, but of course everyone can be perfectly fine with capitalism and still be exploited, but the parasitical consumptive regional syndicates. So how would you address that theoretical well, critique? That there, there's not a difference between the two because say you have like you work at like Michaels for example, so your particular union at Michaels would elect a delegate that would be part of the larger federation that would oversee you know that particular industry making frames apparently, so that's along industrial lines, but then your same union consist you know consisting of the same workers would also then have a delegate to the labor cartel, is the word Rocker uses for it, which would be geographically based. So, and that labor cartel would then be responsible for distributing uh, you know, production in this particular geographic area. So, from the same union, you would have delegates that would be part of that industrial um, federation, and then also part of the labor cartel or this other federation that's responsible for distributing um, you know, what is, what is produced. So there wouldn't be that separation or the gap between producers and the consumers, because clearly all of us are both, like your worker. Um, so there, it would just be that people from that same, um, from that same initial union, for example, would have representation in both of these, like, parallel um, 
organizations, so to speak. Rocker refers to it as like the two poles around which like society would, would function. Any other questions? Maybe one more from Greg and then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting beat up, man. Oh, yeah. <coughs> All in good fun. It's only good fun if he agrees with you. <laughs> also, I have a poll for you. Um, well, I mean, here's the thing. Marx's critique of both Proudhelm and the anarchists um, goes back to his critique of capital. Um, and Marx's position on capital, which you can agree or disagree with, is the real exploitation in capital occurs because of the contradiction, that is to say, the difference in value between use value um, of labor, which is um, what it means to actually go to work, to work in the factory, to expend your life, to you know, make cars or whatever, and the exchange value, which is to say the value that that car fetches on the market, you know, $10,000. Well, your wage is a fair market wage. It's paid at a market price. Um, you get that market price. But also, you, uh, you don't ever, uh, but also uh, the, the car is paid at a, a fair market price. And yet, somehow, the capitalist gains value out of that. This becomes surplus value. It's, the, it's where the exploitation happens. But in this case, okay, you have the uh, industrial uh, syndicate, and you ha also have the consumptive uh, labor cartel. But in this case, then, the difference between the two on how you get products, unless you essentially have a state apparatus that is just dictating, which is fine, I mean, I'm, I'm for that, uh, what people can and can't get, and determining the conditions of rationing. But if it's fair trade, right, which is what anarchists have traditionally pushed, is that you have a fair trade, a free association of labor um, that is trading among individuals, a free association of commodities, um, then in that case you just reproduce capital, except it's abstract capital that is localized between the contradiction between the industrial union and the labor cartel, and the surplus value generated will simply go, essentially the capital, would just go to those firms that are able, um, either through their productive capacity or more likely through their ability to manipulate the market. And I don't mean like in a nefarious way, just like they can buy and sell their products in the most skillful fashion. Yeah. Um, that they will be able to then reaccumulate capital. Is that a problem? Is there a solution to that? Uh, well, I mean, just been posed to me, so I have to think about it. Okay. So I don't have, no, I don't have an answer. Do you have for one more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last one. Um, so, as for the, uh, again, this is simply a theoretical rather than practical distinction of the union as the basis of, uh, of, of radicalization. Uh, Lenin makes this point quite clear in what is to be done, which is within the context of the capital system, any given individual's fight is an individual fight for self-interest within the capital system. A demand for a higher wage is above all a demand to be able to participate more fully in the capitalist system. And as a matter of fact, there's no essence for any econ economic struggle fundamentally that will ever lead us to a revolutionary ideology. That me demanding more and more and more wages, more and more and more benefits, less and less and less hours, doesn't politically enlighten me. Um, but as a matter of, essentially. I'm saying you can't snowball your path to, uh, to a path of inner peace. Well, that's inside reference that isn't particularly exactly. germane. Um, it's not germane. But, uh, but I mean, this is, this is the thing. Is, and it, in principle, we could imagine uh, you know, a, a worker getting more, up, uh, an asset total, like infinite amount of money, infinite amount of benefits, and you know, an infinitely declining work week. But there's no reason to presuppose they would ever see any problems in the capitalist system. In fact, it seems quite the opposite. So in this case, the Marxist critique is that the fundamental realm of struggle for communists or anti-capitalists is not in the economic form, but rather in the political form to create universal political demands on the economic, like, say, a minimum wage. Or well, I think... Rocker tried to, and I maybe didn't convey it very well, but in the book he tries to kind of make that point that we are need to be involved in the political realm. You can't just leave politics aside 
just like we're trying to get rid of capitalism, you're also trying to get rid of the state and the influence of the state, or the oppression of the state is maybe a better way to say it. And so in the political realm, any battles that can be won for more rights, for people less oppression, is something that you should be involved in. And the general strike, using an economic weapon, is something that is used in, in order to accomplish things in the political realm. So with unions, uh, you know, they are, um, unions are ambivalent. Unions can be reactionary and economist, as you guys say, or they can be revolutionary. And the whole point of anarcho-syndicalism is that to, to establish revolutionary unions or revolutionary syndicates that at the same time are teaching people how to fight um, and resist capitalism and the state um, and of course, you know, you'll win some concrete things like higher wages in the course of it. But the more important lesson, besides the fact that maybe it prevents people from living in just terrible poverty, but the more important thing is that that becomes a school for people to learn how to organize and how to fight and win um, rights and hopefully um, accomplish a revolution. So I don't know, know why you would be upset about that, because even like, say, um, if I recall correctly, Josh Sykes and people in FRSO, they're really active in unions. And part of, um, you know, just from, for example, the mass line, the idea of that is that people learn by doing. And so how do you, how do you really teach people um, about socialism and about the revolution without having them engaged in these concrete struggles day by day? If you take the example of the Social Democrats in Germany, well, all they were doing is like getting people to vote for them. And so they had a pretty successful political party, but as soon as there was um, this effort by the Nazis to take over the country, they didn't have like this huge militant base of people that they could call on, because all they were doing is getting people to vote for them, and so they put up no resistance to the Nazis whatsoever. So I don't really see a difference between what he's advocating and what, say, someone like you know Josh Sykes is doing in unions, and again from the, from that idea of the mass line of people learning through doing this. All right, well, it's a little bit past 10 o'clock. We should uh, give Will a hand.